So, hello everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight uh, to our Sustainable Broomfield meeting. We are pleased to welcome Dave Carter here with the Broomfield Farmers Market and what was the, the National Bison Association? That's correct. All right, perfect. So he's going to talk about how bison can help with regenerative agriculture and all about the farmers market and how we can help support it. So I will just let you take it away. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brianna. Yeah. First of all, I apologize for Vince. He invited me to come last time and I didn't put it on my calendar. <laughs> and I am so bad, I didn't even remember it until she sent me an email going, gosh, I'm so sorry you couldn't be with us last week. Sorry. My apologies. You get more time now. You would have had a, a short time okay, frame, so this well, is great. even better. Oh, well, great. So anyway, well, I'm glad to be with you. Just to give you a, a little bit of uh, introduction on myself. Um, born and raised in Colorado. Uh, born in Longmont. Grew up in Allen's Park. Uh, Boulder County's last public one-room school. Uh, graduated from Lyons when it was a little uh, bedroom community. Went to college in Grayling. And I, even though I grew up in a rural area, I didn't grow up in agriculture. Uh, my wife and I got our journalism degrees at UNC and we decided we wanted to buy a weekly newspaper <clears throat> but didn't have any money. And so after working on the Dillon paper for a couple years, I ended up doing PR for the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, which is sort of a sister organization to the Grange, uh, history of the farm protest movements, and fell in love with agriculture, and um, <clears throat> so I spent 25 years with the Farmers Union, was president of the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union for the last eight years, and decided in 2001 it was never too late to have a midlife crisis. So um, I had gotten involved a lot with alternative agriculture and natural meat production, co-op development. Um, I was actually serving as uh, the chair of the of USDA's National Organic Standards Board when the organic standards were developed. So I was just going to go off and do consulting and it turns out the National Bison Association needed an executive director so I backed into that and uh, still do some consulting but then about two years after i started as executive director my wife and i bought our first five heifer calves and so now we're partners in, with two other ranchers uh, in a herd of about 240 mother cows that are on a ranch that is owned by the savory institute in south of strasburg and uh, if you've ever heard of alan savory he is one of the pioneers in holistic management and regenerative agriculture, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So, <clears throat> my wife and I have lived here, we live in Westminster, we've uh, been going to Holy Comforter for the better part of about 40 years, so I'll talk about the farmer's market first of all, and then segue into to bison, <clears throat> but um, we had what we called the green team at uh, Holy Comforter, and we were real proud of ourselves. We changed out all the light fixtures, we we're saving energy, and so we got together um, a couple. In fact, they might even be, I don't know if they're involved, uh, Dave and Carol Tillman. Are yes, they, okay. they were so involved. Okay, well, God bless. You know, Dave's having a hard time right now. He is, yeah. Um, but he's back home. Good. Um, yep. I was wondering how he was doing. Right yeah, now. he's <laughs> doing a lot better. Yeah, I'm going to stop by and say hi to him. Um, probably. Uh, Wednesday night, but yeah, we were we were at the Tillman's, and I always say uh, we probably drank too much of Dave's homebrew um, because somebody mentioned that Broomfield didn't have a farmers market, and so we decided, what the heck? How how hard can that be? And so <laughs> we uh, started the farmers market. I don't know how many of you have been to the to the farmers market, but this is our eleventh year. This has been kind of a tough year for it. It's a rebuilding. Uh, we're a lot smaller than we've been, but a lot of that is, you know, not only are we under federal and state and county and city jurisdiction, but the lot is actually owned by the Episcopal Diocese of Colorado, and the uh, bishop of the Episcopal Diocese is super cautious, super conservative. She said she didn't want anybody dying on COVID from something they got at an Episcopal church under her watch, and I fully support that. Um, so this year we didn't even really know until 
first of May, if we were going to be able to have a normal farmer's market. And I normally do our recruiting in, you know, February, March, and April. So, um, but we've had a good year, but it's about half the size as it is normally. And we're hoping next year we can have, uh, you know, get back to the way we loved it. But the farmer's market, there were really two things, I think, that helped us get started at, at the beginning. Number one was we developed a mission at the time that we still operate under today, which is to create a destination to connect the community with healthy food of local farmers and a destination that demonstrates the stewardship commitment to the Church of the Holy Comforter. And so, um, you know, that first part of that mission statement has been really important for us to say, okay, we want this to be a gathering place on Tuesday afternoons where people can come and not only visit with local farmers and local food um, vendors, but bring their kids and have some activities and grab some dinner and a food truck and sit down and enjoy some live music and just connect with their neighbors. So that's, you know, kind of guided us. Um, the second thing that was really important was when we started the governing board of, of Holy Comforter, and I think this is pretty remarkable because at that time we were in some dire financial straits as, as a church. We were trying to keep the lights on. But the governing board said, well, two rules. Number one, don't lose any money. We can't afford that. But number two, if you generate any revenue above or beyond your operating expenses, it needs to go back to the community. Uh, it's not going to be used to support the church. And so we've operated for the last 11 years, all volunteer. Uh, I think we're Colorado's largest all volunteer market. And we're really pleased we're starting to get some volunteers from outside of the church circle because we really want this to be a community market, not just a, a, a church market. This year, we were really pleased we had the local Dean Malay chapter come in and help with our setup and takedown, which, tell you what, when you're a 67-year-old guy and you got young kids in there helping to set up pop-up tents, it's a, it's a great thing. Um, but we've really tried. We started off, we've given you know money back to Broomfield Fish and the Precious Child and Meals on Wheels. And <clears throat> the last few years, our big outreach has been to the teacher community. And um, we had to suspend it last year, but <clears throat> this year we revived it. And Tuesday after Labor Day, we had Teacher Appreciation Day. And any teacher that showed up and showed us their ID got $20 in coupons to spend with any vendor at the market. And uh, we uh, had uh, $1,200 that we you know, provided to local teachers because we just say, even in normal years, teachers make sacrifices, you know, out of their own pocket to buy supplies, and and now they're, you know, getting caught in all of the politics of masks or not masks, and you know, all of that. So it, it was just a little thing that we could do to show some appreciation. So, um, you know, that's none of us, I think, imagine that we'd be doing this for 12 years or 11 years, but we're still having fun. Dave and Carol Tillman are, are, are cornerstones of, of the market. They, they've been just great. Um, but it's, you know, what we see, again, is that destination to, to bring people together. Food is so important, and access to food is so important. And so two of the other things that we're really proud of is that um, – we started doing this out of our own resources, but now through Live Well Colorado, we're able to double the benefits for anybody that's on SNAP, the old food stamps. If they come in, they've got $20 in SNAP benefits, they get $40 in, in uh, strip to spend at the market. And then in cooperation with city and county of Broomfield, um, we put together a program the last couple of years where anybody that's on WIC gets $10 in vouchers every year. And last year, with all of the difficulties, and we kind of extended it this year, is that Miller Farms, who's our largest produce vendor, uh, actually delivers the produce to the WIC recipients because so many of them don't have transportation.
that's that's a little bit on the Broomfield Farmers Market. So, any questions or any thoughts? And the other thing that's helped us succeed is after the market every Tuesday night, we go to one of the local brew pubs. And, uh, <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> and we call it our debriefing session. There you but, go. Uh, Just supporting local business. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. We have two more markets. So tomorrow night uh, we, we have the market. And then the last Tuesday is the annual Not Your Westminster Dog Show. So you were talking about your dogs. You can bring your, your dogs. And uh, uh, the Wagon Weish is helping us to sponsor it, but we uh, have prizes for longest tail and the oh, best yeah. dog owner lookalike and musical set. So. Nice. <laughs> so now I'll make a big segue. That's all right. Go okay. for it. Thank you. <laughs> so hopefully I'm going to make you all feel good about eating some meat and the environment. Good. Um, because I know there's a lot of you know talk these days about livestock and the environment. And best thing we can do is eat less meat, and some people take that to the extreme, saying, "Okay, let's just have up meat." And I want to talk a little bit about why that would probably be the most devastating thing we could do to our environment. Um, and to tell the story, I have to go back about two hundred thousand years. <laughs> because that's when the first ancestors of bison came across uh, from Siberia, uh, across the, the infamous land bridge here. And they were huge. They were big animals. They were called bison priestess. And because the Ice Age was intensifying at the time, they actually got larger and evolved into what was called bison latrophons, which was an animal that had about a seven foot Oh, you can see one down in the Denver Museum of Natural History. They got a skull down there. Huge animal, seven foot uh, horn span on it. Well, then a couple of things started to happen. First of all, the ice age started to ebb. So the climate started to warm up. And the second thing was that predators, uh, including humans, learned, started to learn to hunt in packs. And so being a big lumbering animal was no longer an advantage. So your uh, choices were you could either downsize and become more nimble, or you could go extinct. And the woolly mammoth went extinct. The bison began to evolve. And they began to evolve as, again, the climate was warming, and we started to see these ecosystems uh, develop. And they really evolved then in concert with the grassland ecosystems. And I say ecosystems multiple because there's multiple ecosystems. And if you think about it, I always like to say that the grasslands of North America bear the indelible hoof print to the bison. Because as those ecosystems evolved, the grasses that developed evolved under the grazing, continuous grazing of ruminants, not just bison, deer, antelope, the others, but bison were definitely the keystone species. Um, the wildlife species, predator species, the birds came in. The bison wallows created these depressions that captured the water. And if you go up to the Dakotas these days and drive through a lot of what they call their prairie potholes, actually started off as bison walls. And, uh, and this is important because grassland ecosystems historically accounted for about 30 to 40 percent of North America's land mass. And they are an incredible carbon capture, carbon sequestration system. Uh, those grasses Take, oxygen, take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it down into the soil. And I like to call them North America's rainforest. Because if you think about it, you know, we talk about the forest and the importance that they play in capturing carbon, and it is very important. 
But if you think about, you know, a tree, there's all of that up above ground. And it captures the carbon, but a lot of that's sequestered above ground, and you have the roots. Yeah. With grasses, it's the opposite. You'll have this much above ground, and then underneath you have this vast series of roots that take that carbon and put it back into the soil. And the University of California, Davis, a couple years ago published a study that they called grasslands a more resilient carbon trap than forests. Because if you think about it, all of that smoke and stuff we had there this, this summer, that was all carbon. That was all carbon that was getting released back into the atmosphere because of those forest fires. And in fact, the uh, Colorado State Forester said in the Denver Post last month that their forests the last couple of years have been net carbon emitters because of that going back in, because of the forest fires. So the grasslands do this incredible job of capturing carbon and putting it into the soil but they can't do it by themselves. They need a gardener to take care of it. And of course, gardener that nature provided was the bison. So <clears throat> the grasslands and Alan Savory, who's again with the Savory Institute, started recognizing this about 50 years ago, that grasslands are what we call a brittle environment. And so those grasses, under a normal year, we'll produce about 30% more foliage than could decompose because it's a dry, you know, semi-arid system. And so if you just take everything off of the grasslands and leave them there, they're going to choke themselves out. They're going to oxidize and they're going to turn that into a desert. So you had these packs of animals that would come through tightly bunched because they herd animals, avoiding the predators. They would come into an area, they would hit it hard, they would graze it down really hard for a few days. They would wallow, They're, they would have the manure, the urine. Again, Mother Nature didn't provide the moisture for this, to put the moisture in the, in the rumen of that animal to break down those grasses and turn it into manure and urine and put it back into the soil. The hooves would push the seeds and stir the soil, and then they would move off. Either predators would come in and chase them off, or I like to think that probably flies mature after about eight, eight, eight days out of a manure paddy. And so if you're in an area and the flies were bad, why don't you just go over here where the flies were? But they would leave that alone for a period of time. And what would happen then is those grasses would come back and the roots would go down and they would be healthier over the long period. And so, you know, a lot of the livestock practices over the last you know, 15 years, we talk about overgrazing and, you know, these type of things. Well, it's because we broke the natural cycle of that animal in, in, in the land. Because what happens is if that animal comes in and, and, and takes what we call the first bite, is there for you know a few days, whatever, and bites that down, all of a sudden that plant's going to say, okay, I'm losing my solar collectors. I need to get more leaves up there to capture that sunlight. So it's going to sacrifice some root strength and put all of its energy into getting more leaves up. Well, if that animal comes back a week later or whatever and bites it again, well, it's got to sacrifice a little more roots. Animal keeps doing that finally, it just you don't have the root system. So the best thing to do is let those animals go in and take that first bite for about a week and then take them off and let that grasses because not only do those leaves come back, but they put down new roots. The roots that have died create some channels for moisture to go back into the ground. You create that, that healthy ecosystem. So that's what a lot of us are doing, and, and in fact, um, where we're at, out on the Savory Ranch, it's 7,800 acres, and we have 17 different paddocks, and so we have a very 
specific. I don't know if any of you have seen Kiss the Ground, uh, but if you haven't, it's a great movie. And there's a couple of people in there that talk about their grades in there. But we systematically look at that, and we put the bison into an area for an amount of time, and we move them somewhere else, and we monitor that land to say, okay, when are these grasses, when are these plants fully restored? It's time to bring the animals back in. And they, and they may not be back in there for three months or four months. But it's that rest period that's, that's really important. Well, the other aspect of that that nature did pretty well was not only these animals to create the healthy grassland, but those animals converted carbohydrates, plant matter that's undigestible to us, into a really, really tasty protein. And that's the thing that we are trying to convey to folks now is that if you want to continue to restore bison, to the ecosystems of North America, the best way to do it is to eat bison. Yeah, you gotta eat, Ted Turner likes to say, you gotta eat them to save them. Because that creates the incentive for us to, to bring back more, more of the animals. And, you know, we, I like to think that bison represents the biggest market-based restoration, species restoration story in North America. Because we went from 30 to 40 million animals before the European settlers down to about 700 to 750 were left alive in 1885. And thanks to some conservationists in the East, uh, Dr. Hornaday and Teddy Roosevelt, uh, that started the American Bison Society back in 2005. But here in the West, there were a handful of ranchers. Most of them had been involved in hunting bison to near extermination. Most of them were prodded by their wives to go out and start gathering up the remnants and to create what we call the five foundation herds that almost all of the bison now today come from. We're back up to 400,000 in North America. Um, slightly more in the US than in Canada. And we have set a goal of, we call it bison one million. We want to get one million bison back in North America. But we also have a goal that we don't want to commoditize. We don't want to turn bison into a mainstream commodity. We always want to be a niche. Um, because once you start thinking about something as a commodity, it's about producing as much volume as you can, the, the shortest time you can, at the cheapest cost you can. And it's about producing items that are all identical. And fortunately, we've let the bison teach us. Uh, and I say that because uh, periodically in the National Bison Association, we, we put out a publication called the Bison Producers Handbook. And we update it periodically. But we put out the last one two years ago. And we were, as we were putting it together, I went back and read the first version that was in 1985. It was actually a little supplement to a magazine. It wasn't even a full book. And as I read that, I thought to myself, you know, this should have been named Everything I Know About Raising Cattle. Um, because what was happening were a lot of cattle ranchers. They were fed up with the industrialization of the cattle and, you know, the concentration. They came into bison, and the theory was bigger fences, stronger handling facilities, and then treat them like cattle. There was even a section in there on dehorning. You know, would artificial insemination work on bison? And slowly, we realized that Mother Nature did a really, really good job of perfecting this animal through the years. And so maybe the best thing we can do is just step back. Not and so today, the management practices that we have with bison is we don't dehorn them, we don't castrate them, we don't brand them, we don't use artificial insemination. It's romance out in the pastures. You've got to have a bull out there with it. Um, and as one of uh, a young woman up in Wisconsin likes to say, yeah, bison are a little bit harder to handle 
but they're a whole lot easier to raise. Because we find that the less that we do, the better they do. And you know, part of that is you, you think about in the winter, if a blizzard comes through, um, domestic livestock will let that wind push them. They'll walk with the wind. Well, if you think about it, that's going to take you into a snowdrift or a ditch or whatever. Bison instinctively will turn you into the wind and start walking upwind because they know that's probably where the ground's getting blown through. Um, their hump is just a huge mass of muscles that exist mainly to move that head around. So they can use that head as a snow plow or they can use it to get down to the, to the feet. Their eyelashes are designed to keep their eyes from freezing up. Um, the only animals that have a more insulating fur on them in North America is the beaver and the polar bear. So if you ever see those pictures, a lot of times you'll see pictures in the winter of the bison out there and they got the snow all over them. That's because that snow's not melting. They're fine. They're fine. You know, cattle again, not because of the way they've been bred necessarily, but snow hits them and it melts. And it goes down and it hits their skin and so their metabolism has to go way up to keep themselves warm. Whereas a bison has that snow on them, their metabolism actually drops. They use less energy. So the great thing, you know, after we have a blizzard, I wake up in the morning and I don't worry about trying to get out to Strasbourg to feed animals. They're going to do just fine. And even during calving season, if you think about the natural cycle of the edible, we haven't bred them to give calves bigger than Mother Nature intended. Cattle today give about 100 to 120 pound calf, and so cattle ranchers are there during calving season 24-7. Bison give about a 40 to 45 pound calf. Um, best thing we can do during calving season is go fishing. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's just incredible. Again, by you think about it, so we're in September right now. The animal has been bred. It's kind of come, come through July to September is, is the, red, the breeding season. That female is enjoying the best grass of the year. She's on the game, she's healthy, she's ready to conceive. Now she's got a calf in her. You come into the fall, they always say that we never grain fed animals historically. Well, kind of, sort of. But this time of year, you go out in a pasture and you look across it at sunset, there's that golden, guess what all that is? Those are the seed heads of the grasses that are a grain that are higher in fat and so they're putting that fat onto that female animal so that she's going to go into the winter with enough body there to carry herself and that fetus through the winter. And then she will lose about 10 to 15 percent of her body weight through the course of the winter. Come April, when calving season starts, she's slimmed down. Her birth canal isn't full of fat. That fetus isn't overly fat. So again, go away, let them do what they do. So anyway, those are just some little uh, factoids on, on bison. Um, and then the, the last thing I, I will say is, okay, we've had people say, well, you want to restore a million bison, but you don't want to turn it into a commodity. How, how do you justify those two? Well, the average person in the U.S. eats about 50 pounds of beef a year. Uh, they eat about 40 pounds of pork a year. They eat about 80 pounds of poultry a year. So we did the math, and the best we can come up with is the average person eats 0.08 pounds of bison per year. So we could triple the size of, of our herds and everybody get a quarter pounder once a year. So we think we can do this, get back to a million bison without turning them into a commodity. So anyway, I do have some little, you know, we have um, put together a couple of things. One of them, we've trademarked a couple of things. One of them we call bison 
nature's original plant-based protein. Um, because if you think about it, I don't know how many of you have ever taken a look at the ingredient panel on Impossible Burger, but it's a, like 26 ingredients long, most of them you never heard of. One, one of them I looked up and its main commercial uses is a stool softener. <laughs> And I think, okay, if bison, if we had to put an ingredient panel on it, it would say grass, grain, nettles. And that would be it. So the other one is, is we call it uh, regenerative by nature. So you can have that. And then here's some recipes, too, that you can. Here's these ones. Um, and my website is bisoncentral.com. So you can go on there, there's lots of information, there's recipes, there's cooking tips, information. We actually have an app you can download that's called Buy Some Bison. And you can go on there and you can find even local producers that will say it. Do you have a question? Yeah. A few years ago, I was at the north rim of the Grand Canyon. There's a bison herd down there. And the ranger told me they started with... Buffalo Jones. Huh? Buffalo Jones is the guy. <clears throat> well, they started roughly, roughly and they're shipping them off to the Native Americans. That yeah, that one, shipping? that that herd on the north rim of the of the Grand Canyon is sort of a controversial one um, because one of the things you know, people from time to time we we have folks say, well, I understand that there's cattle genetics. And, Bison. Uh, it makes people think, gosh, everybody's you know, out there across breeding these animals. And that's not the case. Um, but what happened is when we went through that bottleneck and you had these handful of ranchers gather up the herds, there were several of them. They'd gone through a, a huge blizzard in the early 1880s and they noticed their cattle herds got decimated and these, you know, renegade bison that they picked up were doing just fine. So they thought, gosh, what would happen if we crossbred? And we want to create a, a cattle herd. We want it to be a winter hardy animal. Well, they found out that their first generation bulls were sterile and their females had calving problems and bad attitudes. So they quit doing it. But one of the herds that they did it the longest was one down around that area in the Grand Canyon. There was this guy by the name of Buffalo Jones that, that tried it for years and years and years. So they're trying to get some of those out. And they've actually had some permits for people to come down and hunt those animals because they're overstocked. And yeah, they are weeding them out. Just, it, it's interesting. Those of us that are in the, in the bison business, our code of ethics prohibit crossbreeding the animal with any other species. And we actually have some of the, particularly Ted Turner and some of the larger ranches, are actually doing genetic testing when they do their roundups. And if they find that they have animals with any high level of, of cattle in aggression, they weed them out because bison that are bison do better on the, on the grasses that we have out there. So, so where are the five major herds? The five major herds were, there was uh, Charles Goodnight down in Texas who People will remember is the Good Night Loving Trail. The, the Buffalo Jones out of um, uh, was out of Kansas. It was the Pablo Allard herd, which was in Montana, um, which they pulled together from some folks, including Walking Coyote, who's there's an interesting story with his. Um, and then there was um, Scotty Phillips in uh, South Dakota, and then up in Canada, the Craig up in Canada. Those were kind of the five foundation foods. Are the ones in like uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton, are those raised and then put to nope. slaughter or are they just roaming? They're just roaming and, and Yellowstone it always gets controversial because bison had a natural migration pattern. Well, when they created Yellowstone Park, they didn't create it. And so every year the bison tend to migrate out of Yellowstone and because there's fears about brucellosis among the cattle ranchers, even though the National Academies of Science have said that elk are the transmitters of brucellosis. Um, they either try and haze the animals back into the park or they let the Native Americans come and, and hunt them. Um, so, you know, it's 
it's hard to do. And I, I grew up on the border, Rocky Mountain National Park, so I you know, love the national parks. But you can say we're just going to let the animals roam and everything. But even with a national park, you've got a border. They're fenced in somehow. So, you know, I think Custer State Park is, is a good model that they measure and see how much their park can hold, how are the grasses doing. And then every year they round up and they sell off some excess just to keep their herd managed. Do the bison get fattened? fattened? Do they go to a feedlot or anything like that? Before we have grass? folks that do both green finishing and grass finishing. Uh -huh. um, you know, the challenge that you have in doing a purely grass-fed animal in North America is the animal picks up the flavor of whatever it was eating before it was, it was harvested. Harvested is a nice way to say slaughtered. Yeah. Um, and that's why you see most of the grass-fed beef that's in the market is either coming from Uruguay or Australia mm. or New Zealand because their climate is more like this. Her climate is is like this. And so uh, Sue and I are getting ready to process an animal because this is a great time of the year to process animals because they're coming off of this grass. Mm -hmm. You process just an animal off the pasture in February, it's going to taste gamey and it's going to be you know, a little tougher. So, so we have folks that do some, some grain finishing. The, the differences you would do with bison is A, it's not a, what you call as hot of a ration. Uh, it doesn't have as much corn, it has more roughage in there because the rumen isn't set up. Number two, you don't do it as long because you don't have, you don't want the internal marbling in there and after a while all you're doing is putting on back fat so you and number three is you got to give them a lot more space um, because they have a natural pecking order and you put animals in real tight and they're going to be burning up a lot of energy figuring out who's on top so that's a plus one now saying that we have the difficulties with the grass fed is we have a lot of folks doing research and like on how do we how do we address those variabilities? Because more and more people are saying, I want a grass fed. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've switched to uh, Pasture Provisions, which does um, local pasture raised beef uh, locally for, yeah. for all my meat. No, you, you can do it. It's just a lot more labor intensive yeah. to, to do it that way. Yeah, it probably reflects in the price. Yeah, so. and that's why it's more expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is bison cheaper than? Bison is more expensive than beef. Um, a, we have it. It's illegal to use growth hormones in bison. We're happy about that. Um, so the animals don't grow as quick. We haven't bred them to be meat wagons. So you're not going to get the, the big yield off of a carcass. The, you know. And we go through smaller processing facilities. You know, the largest bison processing plant in the world is in Brush, Colorado, and it can do maybe 200 head a day. The JBS plant in Greeley can do 4,000 head a day. So, you just you know those differences. Are you assured that when you're buying bison that it's grown in a regenerative agriculture setting, or do they get overgrazed and stuff? People too? can mismanage bison just like they mismanage anything, and that's why you know, various certification programs, Savory has their land to table program or going to a farmer's market and visiting with somebody who raises the animal um, and just finding out, you know, how they do it. Because, yeah, we we have a code of ethics. We have, but you know, we don't have an enforcement arm in the National Bison Association yeah. to be able to go out and kick people out if they're not doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about, you know, Yep. How does it, how is, what does the offset look like for what the animal generates versus what, what it's helping? Um, so yeah, in terms of methane emissions, um, let's just put it this way. So where we're at, um, our carrying capacity is 28 acres per animal unit, which is either a bull, 
or uh, a, a female in her cat. So um, I don't have a way of measuring how much methane comes out of that one animal that's been wandering around 28 years. Yeah, I'm sure you have an idea. Uh, yeah, it's it's not a lot. Um, I mean, it's you know they're they're fermenting. Their their rumens are fermentation systems. So yeah, there is. But we are measuring how much carbon is getting sequestered. And uh, we actually have some of our folks, uh, the 777 Ranch up in South Dakota, a young uh, woman, Mimi Hillenbrandt, is just awesome. And she's really the first one that has entered into, because she's been doing holistic management since the late 80s. And so she's been able to measure how much carbon we're putting back in the soil. And she's actually now selling her carbon credits and United Airlines and you know, whomever is buying her carbon credits. Yeah. Are they just doing soil testing and stuff for carbon? Yep. And then do um, cows versus bison emit about the same amount of methane? It's about the same. And, you know, and, and some of it depends on their, their diet. You know? And we're having trouble digesting something. We emit a lot more methane. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> again, if you're forcing something into that animal, you're going to cause more of that. If you're letting them kind of graze naturally, then there's, you know, going to be less. Other questions? I just have a comment. I, um, we're going to have a lot of students trying bison burgers because his school district, Boulder Valley, is having a Colorado crowd day where they're serving bison burgers. Serving bison, yeah. so I know the, the ranchers that are providing oh, okay. that. Yeah, no, uh, Rex Moore uh, with Rock Rim Ranches right here in Colorado. Okay. Is, is is it, okay. Yep. So, you know, they'll do a good job. Yeah. And, and, of course, Boulder Valley Schools and Cooper is retired as their uh, food service director. But she, she was a national leader in getting schools to start the source of food. So that's great. Yeah. Now, he won't try it, but we're working on it. He doesn't really <laughs> eat anything but peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll get that. We'll get yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Well, I just, sorry, but I just kind of want to turn around. My wife brings home bison meat to one of the local newspaper. I think she maybe read an article in one of the college or something. I appreciate it. Um, kind of like she is. So, when she brings it home, is it regenerative and certified? Where do you go to? Well, again, the bison, bison map. Can connect you with ranchers and they'll tell you exactly how their, their process is doing it. Um, it's bison, B U Y S O M E, bison. Yeah, you can download it, it's a free app. Most of the bison that is in the, the grocery stores, particularly in this area, is Great Range bison, which is based here in Colorado, but they source their bison from about 30 different ranches around. And their ranchers do a really good job there, but they're, you know, they're not specifically focused just on regenerative. But if you want to, you know, connect with somebody that's, again, local, tell you, you know, how they raise the animals. Are there people that raise bison in Europe? Is that well, there is actually a European So, again, the animals started off in Europe. Caves in France, those drawings are you know, nice looking animals. So in Europe, it's actually called the Wiesen, and it is a threatened species over there. There's very few of them, and they're mainly in Poland, and, and we're trying to, to bring them back. But we don't really have, well, there's some commercial bison operations in the UK and Denmark and the like, but they're more tourist. Um, I, I worked with a guy in Poland, and, and didn't realize this, that a lot of families in Poland own castles that came down from, you know, they're figuring out how to keep them afloat because it's pretty expensive. So this guy has taken his castle and turned it into a, a Wild West <laughs> village <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> with cowboys and Indians, and he's got bison there. But, uh, um, so there's a good market for you guys to ship to yeah. over there. Well, there is. This is the frustrating thing for us, in fact. Colorado Department of Agriculture is going to have me go over to Italy next month as a part of a trade mission nice. there to promote uh, bison. The frustrating thing is, okay, so the European Union, 
European consumers have said, we don't want meat raised with growth hormones. So the beef industry has done a really good job of creating what they call their high quality beef export program, where ranchers that are doing this, they go in, they have to certify and be audited that they did not use growth hormones in their animals. And then that beef can go to Europe with no tariff. Well, you'd think that that would be a no-brainer for us because it's illegal to use growth hormones in bison. But because it's called the High Quality Beef Export Program, we're not eligible. So every ounce of bison that goes to Europe has got a 20% tariff on it. So you already have a premium price product and you're putting a 20% tariff. So There's we're working... you can pass, like, legislation? Well, we're working... Uh, Secretary Vilsack, when he was around the first, first time... Um, agreed to try and address that because they were negotiating a, a trade agreement with Europe. And then the administrations changed and all of the trade negotiations went out the window. And so we contacted Secretary Vilsack again and he said, yes, this will be a priority, but it'll take a few years for us to get yeah. addressed. Yep. Other questions, comments? How long does the animals live? Hmm. Um, so, Females can live about 30 years. Can live. It's very rare. They generally live to be somewhere between 17 and 20 years, which is long lived. I mean, that's, you know, we talk about the bison advantage of being low maintenance and all this. Well, the disadvantage is if you're a bison rancher, you don't get your first calf out of a female until she's three years old, whereas the beef guys get it at two. So you're losing a year on the but in the beef business, a 10-year-old cow is pretty well done. So you get almost twice as many calves out of it. And that's a, you know, our operation. Sue and I don't, well, we'll, we'll process a couple of years for the friend, a couple of years for the friends and family. But overall, we're part of a cow-calf operation. So our paycheck comes in once a year. And we wean the calves. So having that animal produce... 17 calves as opposed to eight. Yeah. It's kind of important. Any other questions or anything? Uh, so, well, thank two, you two so much. Two little since yeah. there's so many females here, yeah. I'll just say, <laughs> thing you'll appreciate about the bison is it's a very matriarchal yeah, society. Yeah. The yeah. women run the show. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and the social structure is fascinating. So the bulls are only enough for one thing. So this, you know, right now we're still in the breeding season and with the other than that, they go off by themselves. But you take a look at those dynamics. You'll go out, like I say, we've got about 240 mother cows. But there's kind of family units of about 30 that are there. And there's always a lead cow in each one. She's the matriarch. And so you get her to go someplace, everybody else is going to follow. And um, I'll just finish up with one story that I wished, I wished, I wished I'd been here this, but I was just got so much. We were moving the herd during calving season, and I came up over the hill and was on the four wheeler, and one of the moms had gone off to calve. And usually, when they do it, a couple of other females will go out. We call them buffalo midwives because <laughs> um, they'll help get the calf up and lick it off, and you know. Because the idea is to get it running with the herd as quickly as possible. Well, mom was out there calving, and these two coyotes showed up. Because they know when they're the most vulnerable is when they're calving. So there's lunch. Those two other females got between that mom and those coyotes and just went back and forth. They go one direction, they go the other. They did. And that mom got that calf up, got it licked, just walked back to the herd at the pace of that calf. Didn't even really look back at the cow. She knew they had her back. Nice. <laughs> and got her back to the herd, and those other two females just kind of turned around and walked back to the herd. Like, there we go. That's where we go. And it's just, you know, you just marvel at something like Buffalo, that. Buffalo, bison, what, what's the difference? So, technically, 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 the term is bison. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Technically, 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 buffalo describes water buffalo. Uh -huh. But we've been calling it buffalo for 400 years. 
I cheer for the CU Buffaloes. Accepted. I love Buffalo Trace. Yeah. That was yeah. my high school mascot, Buffalo. Yeah. yeah. And really, it was it was the first French trappers that were either going up the Mississippi or down the St. Lawrence, and they look over and here were these big furry animals. And they called it boof, which is French for beef. Well, the Native Americans caught that, and so in all of the transactions with them, it was buffalo. So today, the Native Americans prefer to call it buffalo, even though technically it's a nice one. And we've gone through a huge issue with this because some folks are from the East And so, particularly, uh, it was, came up in the pet food days. And Taste of the Wild has the high prairie formula made with roasted bison front panel has got this national geographic looking photo of these bison grazing with wolves and sure enough you flip over the ingredient panel and go down to number nine and there's bison but ingredient number one is just listed as buffalo So fortunately, we, it took us three years. We got the pet food regulators to change the definitions, so that if there's water buffalo in pet food, it has to be labeled as water buffalo. Um, it's not as prevalent in the human food, but there's still some areas where you'll see all natural buffalo. In this. And so we're working with FDA and USDA to get that addressed. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> All right.